as many of you know, uh, since a uh, few years ago, I'm working on the <clears throat> biography of the Iranian supreme leader. Uh, because um, um, he has increased his power on various fields from economy to foreign policy uh, uh, in recent years, especially since 2005. And I do believe, as uh, Saeed has uh, confirmed with his study, that he has the upper hand both in military and in political arena in Iran. So I would uh, try to explain uh, how he makes decision and why he makes decisions he makes. Um, <clears throat> Ayatollah Khamenei, when he came to power in 1989, he was uh, a very weak uh, politician. And the reason why he was appointed for this job was that uh, he was a very weak uh, politician. Because those who've been involved in uh, making decision about the succession did not believe that Ayatollah Khomeini can be replaced by anyone in his caliber. Ayatollah Khomeini was, a, uh, was an exceptional, charismatic, leader who came to power through a popular revolution, and uh, uh, nobody could uh, uh, be found with the same qualifications. So they tried to uh, make the institution of the Vilayat of Baqi, or the guardianship of uh, jurist uh, uh, ceremonial, and give the power to uh, the president and the parliament and other political institutions. So they revised the constitution and they um, demolished the position of the prime minister and uh, get centralized the power in the hands of the president. <coughs> and the most powerful person at that time, Mr. Rafsanjani, became the president and one of the weakest politician Mr. Khamenei became the supreme leader. The leadership of Ayatollah Khamenei coincided with the end of Iran-Iraq war. When uh, IRGC people got back from a uh, war front, and they needed to be recognized in the politics of the country. Since constitutionally, the Supreme Leader was the commander in chief of armed forces, he had to ca take care of them. So there was an arrangement between him and, uh, and the president to let IRGC to get involved in construction projects after Iran-Iraq war. So, Revolutionary Guard has been transformed from a military body to a military, economic, political, religious, ideological complex. And Ayatollah Khamenei over the years has uh, 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 reshaped or restructured a Revolutionary Guard to the most powerful entity ever in Islamic Republic. On the other hand, Rafsanjani at that time believed that war ended, ended and, and uh, uh, the most dangerous opposition armed group, uh, namely uh, MEK, has been defeated in Mersad operation. So uh, the intelligence ministry has lost its significance, and president can focus on economy and let the, the supreme leader to oversee the, the minister of, ministry of intelligence. So by focusing on economy, the president has lost his grip over the intelligence apparatus, and because 
officially he didn't have any authority on the military and armed forces. So Ayatollah Khamenei left with uh, military bodies of the country, intelligence apparatus, judiciary, uh, uh, um, and also the uh, state radio and TV. We know that still now uh, the radio and TV is monopolized by the government and the head of the state TV and radio is appointed directly by the supreme leader. Interestingly, uh, for the first decade of, the, for, for the majority of the first decade of Islamic Republic, the head, the first decade, the head of the state TV and radio was Rafsanjani's brother. When Khamenei becomes the leader, one of the first things he does is to replace Rafsanjani and his brother by Ali Larijani, currently the speaker of Majlis. So he tries to uh, uh, consolidate his power by relying on uh, 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 these uh, uh, mechanisms. So having control over intelligence apparatus, military forces, judiciary, state radio and TV enabled Ayatollah, Rafsanj uh, Ayatollah Khamenei to weaken uh, all political institutions, whether president or parliament. <laughs> so it was very easy for him because he had the main propaganda tool, he had Gun in one hand, the key of prison in the other hand, and information. So um, if you read uh, Rafsanjani's diaries in 1989, he writes, today Khamenei came to my office. He was complaining about his life to become so monotonous. He's bored. He doesn't know, he doesn't have much to do. This is Khamenei in 1989. And I'm sure that you would agree with me that today, the life of Ayatollah Khamenei is not too boring and he has many things to do. Um, <clears throat> when Khamenei started to consolidate his power, he found out the main threat, the main challenge to his power is the president. <clears throat> Why? Because president is elected directly by people, while he is not directly elected by people. President is held accountable for major policies of the country. He has to appear on TV and radio, whether domestic or foreign, give interview to journalists, Iranians, or international media, and explain why government has chosen policies it had. So while the supreme leader is not willing to take any responsibility for any of government's policies. And he holds a permanent job. Nobody can remove him from power. So it doesn't matter. President is an open-minded, pro-free market, modernist, pro-civil society <laughs> person like Rafsanjani or Khatami, or a radical Islamist apocalyptic person like Ahmadinejad. Any powerful president can pose threat to the authority of the supreme leader and challenge his, his power. So we had Rafsanjani coming to power for four, first four years. He was so powerful. He was very influential in shaping Iran's domestic and foreign policy. But in the second term, he was very weak. And Khamenei was, one, was the one who, was, who had the final say on major issues. For Khatami, Khatami came to power surprisingly with 20 million votes unexpectedly. Uh, and for two years, everyone believed that 
Khamenei, Khatami, because he's very popular, he would have tremendous power and he would be able to push Khamenei uh, away from uh, uh, making decision on uh, the critical issue like uh, relations with United States or, or nuclear issue. But after two years, Khamenei was able to uh, totally take uh, the executive branch of the government under control and put some of reformists in prison, crack down the student movements, and so on. <clears throat> and the same happened to Mr. Ahmadinejad. Once uh, Ahmadinejad was uh, more in the center of attention than even Khamenei himself, and if you look at the publications, uh, there are many books on Mr. Ahmadinejad, but there is very little book on, on Khamenei, and that's make the market very good for my book. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, look at how many analyses, how many articles have been published on Ahmadinejad while uh, Khamenei was somehow outside the uh, 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 picture. Now Ahmadinejad is totally gone. You know, Ahmadinejad had a helicopter crash four days ago uh, uh, through which he survived. Um, and uh, uh, he was removed from the list of speakers of the anniversary of uh, Ayatollah Khomeini's death while he spoke in this anniversary for eight years. So uh, he's not allowed to give an interview or speech until the end, uh, until election ends which shows that Khamenei is successfully controlled him. OK. This is Khamenei. Khamenei is powerful. So what does it tell to us? Uh, how, he look, uh, how he looks at the world. Um, <clears throat> Khamenei uh, firmly believes that the West, including the United States, has never recognized the, the Islamic Republic. And one of his speeches said that sanctions are not new. United States has put sanctions on us since 1979. So we know how to deal with this. And we know that this animosity uh, between Iran and United States in, is genuine. And it will not go away. Uh, 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 by changing our policies. So he believes since the West has tried several strategies to overthrow Islamic Republic. For Ayatollah Khamenei, eight years Iran-Iraq war, it was not Iran-Iraq war. It was Iran-West war. He believes that the whole West supported Saddam, and they wanted Islamic Republic to be defeated by him. But they didn't succeed. West tried military means. West tried economic sanctions. And now West is trying uh, to use both uh, uh, military, uh, um, cultural invasion and also the pressure on nuclear program to undermine the, the uh, Islamic Republic. So what's our choice? What's the best policy to take? The best policy is resistance. <clears throat> he believes that if we don't resist, we will disappear. And if the main legacy of Ayatollah Khomeini was the foundation of Islamic Republic itself, what would be the legacy of Ayatollah Khamenei? I think he, he believes that the main legacy he would leave is to create guarantees for the survival of Islamic Republic. And he believes that the only thing that can provide such a guarantee is the nuclear capability. Without nuclear capability, uh, economic pressure, cultural invasion, political tools 
would break down Islamic Republic and uh, uh, would uh, uh, fulfill uh, uh, West agenda in, in um, defeating uh, this regime. This is exactly what he has done with his domestic opponents and critics. Whenever he got power, whenever he was able to uh, marginalize and sideline his critics, he did it. Compromise is, is, a, is, a, is a worse policy, according to him. He doesn't compromise with anyone. He doesn't compromise with the first generation of Islamic Republic. He doesn't compromise with Rafsanjani. He doesn't compromise with those who protested in 2009. He didn't compromise with them. Uh, uh, they were, um, recently there was a documentary in which Musavi's advisor, the advisor to the uh, presidential uh, candidate in 2009, who is now under house arrest, he said that after the uh, protest, Musavi had a meeting with Khamenei and ask Khamenei to recount the votes. If you recount the votes, I would resign. And I would not run for president. <coughs> this was a big offer from Mossadi. But Khamenei did not accept it. And the whole country went on a crisis for a year. And tens, ten, dozens of people were killed. And the legitimacy of Khamenei himself was risked. The legitimacy of Islamic Republic was risked. In, in a day of Ashura, which is a sacred day for all Shia around the world, Islamic Republic's police cracked down on people. They killed several civilians, which led to lots of anger in Shia community in Middle East, whether in Bahrain or in Saudi Arabia or even in Lebanon, Ayatollah Khamenei risked his own legitimacy because he did not want to compromise. And what happened a few weeks ago, Rafsanjani stepped in and he wanted to run for president. Without any hesitation, Ayatollah Khamenei disqualified him because he doesn't want to make any compromise. He doesn't want. So uh, no compromise and resistance is his consistent policies, both in domestic politics and in foreign policy. What's interesting is that there was a debate between um, Rouhani, who is a presidential candidate, candidate and who was in charge of uh, nuclear uh, uh, negotiation under Khatami and under Rafsanjani, there was a debate between him and Jalili, who is now the chief negotiator. Rouhani was saying that I made progress in the nuclear program without letting United Nations to pass resolution against Iran. So I was successful. Jalili says that, no, you prevented sanctions at the cost of suspension of uranium. So you, didn't re you did not resist. But the reason why we have sanctions is because we have resisted. The question is, which one was Khamenei's policy? Rouhani policy was Khamenei's policy, or Jalili's policy is Khamenei's policy. I think both were Khamenei's policy. When Rouhani was in charge, Khamenei was not that much powerful. Khamenei was weak. So in order to make decision on nuclear policy, he needed to create a consensus among the influential a lead of Islamic Republic like Rafsanjani and Khatami. As soon as he became powerful, as soon as he became able to sideline Rafsanjani, Khatami, Rouhani, all these all diplomats, he changed the policy 
to the policy of resistance. So this is true about his cultural policy. As Patrick said, two, three years ago, Khamenei, in his public speech, said, why would we need over a million people to study in humanities at the universities? So immediately, immediately the, the, the government has stopped admission of students in 17 majors until they revise the textbook and uh, 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 re-evaluate uh, the professors. So this is Khamenei. We had these majors for a long time in Islamic Republic, but we had these majors, we had uh, students in, in political science, in law, in uh, women's studies, because Khamenei was not powerful. As soon as he became powerful, he started to implement his own agenda. So uh, I do believe that in, in coming years, uh, if Khamenei would still be in charge, if Khamenei maintained the same power he has, or increase his power, the resistance policy, whether in a nuclear issue, or in cultural issues, or in the issue of terrorism, supporting Hamas, Hezbollah, on Iran's policy towards Shia, any policy, the, cult, the resistance would be the, the, the uh, main basis for Ayatollah Khamenei to make decision. Thank you very much.